uh, on and on, but there's so much material. I'm going to just rush ahead and start speaking my paper. The, the introductory verse from the Quran that I've chosen to set the tone is as follows. Uh, as you can see here, uh, no just estimate have they made about God. There will be a trumpet that will be sounded. It will be sounded twice and people will be uh, brought forward. And the earth, this is in this earth, it seems, the earth will shine with the glory of its Lord. The record of deeds will be placed open. The prophets and witnesses will be brought forward and a just decision pronounced between them. They will not be wronged in the least. And to every soul will be paid in full the fruit of its deeds. God knoweth best all that they do. This is the Arabic we can... Uh, move on. This is something that uh, we all look at with wonder time to time. This is not Islamic. This is Bosch, who takes care of our protology, our soteriology, and our eschatology in rather gloomy terms over here. I show it because I want to go to this next slide, which was mentioned by our er earlier uh, Professor Wolf. Uh, the seven deadly sins and the four last things. The word eschaton is actually coined in the 19th century to have a code word to speak about these four last things that are surrounding this circle of the seven deadly sins. So as it's been said several times already, the word eschatology is a, uh, a Christian technical term which we borrow in Islamic studies, faute de mieux. Uh, uh, and this is, but we must know that this is where it comes from. It is quite circumscribed, as was it said earlier, death, judgment, hell, and as it's called in this painting, glory. All right. So this is the backdrop. Uh, as, as was said in the earlier lecture as well, in Islamic eschatological thinking, things are much more complicated than these four last things. So we perhaps like to think about the terminology that we use. Eschatology is a relatively recent technical term in Christian theology. It's from the 19th century, whence it is borrowed or stolen in the study of Islam. It, 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 it may neatly correspond with Islamic matter and it may not. Uh, we have a similar problem with the ideas of orthodoxy and heterodoxy, as is well known in the study of Islam. So we can, we, the, it's always good to attend to the terminological substrate of our discussions. But I, the main thing we need to remember is that Islam is a very interesting example of ethical monotheism. It's, it's sui generis. But it, yet it is it it represents human religious history in a very real sense. It's the brilliant and also taken from us much too soon. Uh, Islamicist Marilyn Waldman Robinson wrote in her beautiful article on eschatology: "One must always keep in view the larger ethical and monotheistic context that surrounds the Quran's." insistence on physical resurrection and consignment to hell or heaven. Taking this insistence out of context has led many modern Western scholars to confuse the sensuous with the sensual. While they ignore, this is the point, this is the reason I wanted to show the Bosch painting, while they ignore the equally sensuous treatments of a Dante, Dante or a Bosch. He's a very instructive bit of advice. Here is a key term from the Sira, a key passage from the Sira, which really sets up the idea of Islam's view about eschatology and Islam's self perception, if you like. Uh, the first hijra that went to Abyssinia, a uh, small number of Muslims, they were hounded by their enemies of the Quraysh who followed them to Abyssinia and tried to petition the Negus to get rid of them, to not let them stay there, to 
badmouth them and to criticize them. When the Muslims came into, and, and the Negus uh, had already had experience of them. And so he asked them what they thought and he summoned their leader, Jafar bin Abi Talib, uh, to explain what this, uh, this is all about. Why are these enemies of yours coming from Mecca to try to convince me to get rid of you? What, it, what is so uh, uh, evil about your beliefs that they would want to do such a thing? And his speech is classic and, and to the point and quite uh, definitive about uh, Islam. O king, we were an uncivilized people, worshiping idols, eating corpses, committing abominations, violating natural ties, treating guests badly, and our strong devoured our weak. Thus we were until God sent us an apostle. The eschatological sequence in Islam is also equally important in the moral or ethical gospel of Islam. And it is part of the, uh, part of the rhetoric of, of, of salvation, if you like, and, and, and the practice of good deeds, which trumps salvation in the Islamic sense, it seems. The, the, the sequence at the prophetic signs, predicting the uh, annihilation or the destruction or the, uh, the great event, the resurrection and the judgment, and then the gathering at the, uh, at the pool, the hollow, uh, where all believers are once again reunited. This is, this is one eschatological sequence. There, there are others, but I want, to, uh, I want to privilege this one here. Um, we have eschatology and we have um, all as event and eschatology as process. And I'm, I'm taking this, my point of departure from the fact that the Quran is a combination of process and event. That is to say, in its two forms, uh, which I, uh, uh, describe in, in my book that I, I wrote on the topic, the Quran is an interesting melding of epic and apocalypse. From the point of view of epic, then eschatology and history are processes. From the point of view of apocalypse, they are event. So we have the al-akhira and the yawm al qiyamah and uh, the uh, al uh, waqiyah and al haqqa and these these great powerful events that the Quran speaks about so beautifully. But then we also have another thread in the Quran, which is origin and return, al mabda wal maad, which is a which is a very important uh, parallel uh, eschatological theme in the Quran. The Quran, the book of Islam, is today published, circulated, and venerated in a form that is called the Musa, the compilation. This form is unanimously recognized in the tradition as a rearrangement of the surahs and verses as chronologically revealed over the lifetime of the prophet. There is virtually no debate on this. That original order of revelation is called Tanzil. And this, this is what is behind the the idea that the Quran is arranged in almost opposite chronological order to the way that it was revealed. The earliest surahs are in the back and the more recent surahs are at the beginning. This, I argue, is in order to emphasize its epic dimension. We can imagine what it would be like to read it the other way. We can imagine what it would be like to read the book of Revelation before we read the book of Genesis. It would be a completely different experience. But those who organized the Quran, and it's variously attributed to the prophet himself with the Gabriel, with angel uh, Gabriel, or with a committee or others, but everyone recognizes that it was rearranged. This is important because it shows that the authenticity of this idea of process and event is is woven into the textual history of the Quran. 
So in the Quranic epic time or epic uh, point of view, Muhammad is a hero, but also humanity in both of its forms as individual and collective participate in the heroic aspirations. God also appears sometimes heroic. Uh, we, we, the Sunnah, which is a word for path in Arabic, provides for the imitation of Muhammad's epic by the believer and, or reader and the community and by extension humanity as a whole. This is a typical sort of chart of the hero's journey. Well known, I think this is from Joseph Campbell, but it's quite opposite. If you look at the Sirah, Stefan Spurl, for example, wrote a very brilliant paper on the idea of the epic as informing the Sirah. So this is not to say that the epic is what influenced the revelation, but it's saying that the audience of the revelation who were familiar with epics uh, influenced the revelation because the Quran is always revealed in the language of its audience. So in this sense, it speaks to the epic expectations of the audience. Um, the, uh, so this is where the idea of origin and return comes in, in the epic mode. It's, the epic mode is, not, is also not empty of apocalyptic uh, and vice versa. The apocalyptic mode is not empty of the epic mode. The two work together in the Quran along the idea of a fugue, if you like, in which their identities are reversed and shared and, and uh, uh, resonated with in the process of the reading or chanting act. So as, as a process, we have many, many words in the Quran for path. The most famous is probably uh, Sirat, uh, which is opens the Quran, but it, it Sabil, Aqaba, Sunnah, uh, Tariq, Tariqa, Rashad, Imam, and so on. The the somewhat gnostically flavored topos of the path is very well represented from one end of the Quran to the other. The idea of a of a journey, a destiny. Uh, a process of uh, uh, buildings, as it were. So uh, there are also many words for, for journey. So epic is frequently the first or oldest literary work of a culture. It opens in Medeus race, as the Quran does with the Fatiha and with the, with the Surat al-Baqarah. Why is that? Because the real beginning of the Quran is not revealed until the seventh surah, 7-172, the day of the covenant, the primordial covenant. We don't know anything about that, although there's many references to the covenant before we get there. But if we're reading it seriatim, as it were, we don't really know. The, so that, but when we do achieve that bit of information at Surah 7, then it becomes clear that Surah al-Baqarah has begun in the midst of things, in Midas Reis. Okay, the setting is vast for, this is, this is a standard definition of what an epic is. Setting is vast, covering many nations, the world or cosmos. Begin, begins with an invocation to a muse. Well, obviously it's not a muse here. It's divine inspiration. It's divine revelation. Starts with a statement of theme, the Fatiha, and makes use of epithet and epic similes, and long lists, features long formal speeches and so on. There, I explore this in uh, more detail in the book. So eschatology as an apocalyptic event is represented by these famous, you know, we're shifting now from epic to apocalyptic re resurrection, al the hour, the day, the event, and uh, the inevitable. These are some of the many, many terms. Ghazali found over a hundred to, uh, to, uh, to that functioned as synonyms within the Quran that spoke about the same apocalyptic day or event or hour. The apocalypse in the Quran is represented in this grid. I won't go through reading it all, but the first item down here, revelation should be at the top because re uh, apocalypse means revelation after all. And then we have all of these other items that are generally understood to inform an apocalyptic text, they're very well represented from one end of the Quran to the other. 
whether in the epic mode or the apocalyptic mode as it happens. One of the chief apocalyptic motifs uh, recognized in the literature, and it's very interesting that it's only recently that the Quran has been recognized as being an apocalypse. Uh, it's been cordially uninvited to most discussions about apocalypse from the, in the last 50 years, but now things are changing. It's getting, uh, it's getting better from that point of view. But the glory motif uh, is, is, is very prominently figured in the in the in the Quran, glory occurs in many many different ways, as power and authority, as light and fire and manifestation or appearance, as uh, as uh, communication, <coughs> uh, uh, which is a part of the revelation, as presence or propinquity or immediacy or nearness, as in the Hablu Warid that we talked about yesterday and through praise and glorification. So, so the Quran text is teeming with, with glory. There's no, we don't have to argue about this. So <clears throat> the Quran and four things, this, this was uh, brought to light by Professor Wansbro in his book, Quranic Studies about which we spoke during the break. He uh, very astutely recognized that in the Quran there are four repeating motifs that may be considered, if you like, the spine or foundation of the Quran. These are retribution, reward and punishment. Sign, the idea of the sign, which is another form of glory. Exile and return. I'm adding the and return. He just mentioned exile. And most importantly, covenant, because this covenant is what ties the entire thing together. I'm just watching the clock to make sure I can try and get through this. It's a bit, uh, perhaps a bit too much. There's a fifth element that is even more prominent in the Quran than these other four. And that is the motif or theme of humanity. I mean, is, the Quran is not the first holy book to mention humanity, but the frequency with which humanity is mentioned in with various words. Uh, uh, from one end of, of, of the text to the next qualifies this as one of its central defining uh, terms. Now, this brings us to covenant. Covenant is the day of alas, the day when God said alas to be rabakum to all future human beings that would ever exist. And this, this event took place in a pre-mundane uh, world or pre-creational world, pre-time and place. And it sets the tone of the relationship because all, all prophets, all followers of all religions, all, uh, all linguistic groups, all ethnic groups were according to this verse present before God who gave them this question. So, so there's this great sense of humanity's oneness. The oneness of humanity is preached just as intensely in the Quran as the oneness of God. <clears throat> and as uh, Franz Rosenthal, uh, I would like to read this. The entire world in all its variety was created by the one creator at one particular moment. It follows that oneness was the ideal state for it at all times and that to which it should always aspire. As the beginning was one, so the expected end of the world is one for everyone and everything, whatever is and takes place in between these two defining points of created time, no matter how varied in detail, follows a set overall pattern. Thus the history of the past and of the future, including that of the present, is fundamentally uniform. No distinction between the three modes of time need be made by the observer of human history. I quote this because I, the next topic is this typological figuration which functions throughout the Quran and holds everything together. It is, it's a part of the, uh, of the textual fabric or textual grammar of the Quran. As, as Zwetler so, showed many years ago, the Surah of the Poets establishes through its 
uh, discourse that Muhammad is not one of the poets, but a member of this group of prophets. And he is, a he is an anti-type in a sense to the types of the prophets that came before. And incidentally, as we all know, Islam posits, even though the Quran mentions 25 or so, the, the tradition posits that there have been 124,000 prophets and every community has had a prophet that spoke to them in their own language. Typological figuration is very powerful because it doesn't use syllogism to argue. It uses, it uses a poetics, a, a, a kind of a, a rhyme, a conceptual rhyming rather than a, a linguistic rhyming in which it, be, it becomes clear that Jesus and Moses and Adam and Muhammad are all of the same uh, essence. The present is an antitype of the past Indeed, in the, in the uh, process of, of experiencing typological figuration while reading or listening to the Quran, time disappears. And this is one of its important uh, 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 tasks. And it also endows the reading experience with, with great intimacy because it's not only the prophets who are typological figures of each other, but their communities are typological figures of each other. So that what is said about one community can apply through typological figuration to the audience community. And this of course is very powerful, especially in the Surah of Joseph has been demonstrated many times. Then we come to the idea of uh, apophysis and metaphor. Apophysis is uh, another key determining factor of the Ilan or the uh, music of the Quran, the utterly unknowableness of God. Uh, there is no connection between God and humanity apart from his mouthpiece, the prophet or messenger. God is forever and infinitely unknowable. This becomes elaborated through theology uh, in many different ways from uh, in post-Quranic uh, uh, intellectual history. So what, what happens is that in order to speak or to know or have any access to God, figured language is required. There can be no direct mathematical language, but there, and there has to be language. So the language that evolves is heavily figured, metaphorical, uh, uh, mathily, uh, and, and so on. So that we find that God tells us in the Quran, since God is speaking, that in fact, he speaks to humanity through likenesses or figures or metaphors. This is, this is how God speaks. He doesn't speak through mathematical numbers so that it, it appeals to each individual imagination to take in the words and uh, contemplate them. The idea of contemplation, of course, is very strong in the Quran. The idea of tadabur and tadakur and, and uh, tafahum and so on. These people must think about the world and think about these signs. The very idea of sign it can be construed as having a metaphorical uh, dimension as well. So I think uh, we'll go here. This is a beautiful example, of course, of the uh, metaphorical way in which the Quran speaks, uh, which God speaks to us about himself and about the Quran and about human history. God is the light of the heavens and the earth. The metaphor for his light is as if there were a niche in which there is a lamp, the lamp inside a globe of glass, the glass just like a glittering star kindled from a blessed tree, an olive neither of the east nor of the west, whose oil would seem to shine of itself, even though no fire touched it, light upon light. God guides to his light whomever he wishes. Thus, God speaks to humanity in metaphors. So, to understand the metaphor, the recent scholarship tells us one must find meanings not predetermined by language, logic, or experience. That a metaphor must have this open-endedness for it to truly qualify. 
And it, it argued here that, or demonstrated that there is nothing more open-ended in the Quran or in Islam than the uh, God, what is God? Utterly remote. Yet at the same time, the Quran is fond of doing, it, it disturbs this feeling by coming up with uh, verses like, this one here we mentioned a couple of yesterday. We created man. We know what his soul whispers to him. We are closer to him than his jugular vein. I have to uh, share this, these last couple of slides. I hope I'm not abusing my time here. In uh, Christian Lange's very brilliant book uh, on heaven and hell and Islam, he, he points out that there is a very interesting relationship between uh, what we're calling eschatology and what we're calling its opposite here, the dunya, I guess. And he cites the canonical hadith, which says the garden is closer to you than the strap of your sandal, and so is the fire. And Christian uh, speaks beautifully about this, demonstrates that the way in which the sandal is constructed, it, what, it, what it symbolizes is this constant interpenetration of the other world with this world. So it really is not completely separate entity for, for uh, the child of the Quran, the person whose consciousness, as Nuiya so beautifully said, whose consciousness has been Quranized. And so this is, a, this is another trope of closeness, which is very important throughout the Quran. It comes up again here, and the prophet says uh, that he, uh, he encountered two Muslims building a mosque out of bricks and mortar. And he said, no, 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 just wood and thatch. This is fine. Like a, make it like a booth that Moses built because the hour will happen much faster than would be warranted than a mosque would in brick would warrant. So don't, don't uh, make it too sturdy unnecessarily. And then another very important closeness Hadith uh, from uh, quoted by Ibn Saad is the time of my advent and the hour are like these two fingers. Uh, uh, this is a uh, uh, so this gives us an insight into a very key uh, aspect of studying eschatology in the in Islam and in the Quran. First, is the it is represents the experience of the prophet. Needless to say, I'm not at all unsure about the question posed yesterday, could we have Islam without the prophet? I think it's utterly, utterly unthinkable and impossible because the Quran is his, his speech uh, and it represents his, his, uh, his experience. We go back to the now 100 year old book of Casanova who saw that the prophet was expecting immediately the advent of the divine kingdom. And that this, this is what intensified and contributed to his intense expressions of nearness and uh, event and uh, cataclysm and enlightenment and so forth. This changed, he, and there's a second period where Casanova says he hesitates, he doesn't know exactly when the hour is coming but he's, it's still coming. And in the third period, Muhammad, because of the attraction of other people to the religion, has become preoccupied with other things. And the, uh, this has, has diminished to some extent. However, it is still the case that in the Quran, the idea of, this, of the hour and other eschatological symbols are equally distributed throughout the various uh, Mecca and Medina phases of the text. So a metaphor is the bridge to reality, is the, the, the venerable Arabs state, Arabic statement. Uh, and it should be also remembered that the Quran is heard and not read. And that, that it, is, it is, and when it is heard, it is felt. And when, when the, the figures are encountered, they are felt and they are, irresistibly metaphorized in the consciousness of who hears it. Uh, this is, this is uh, the predicament of being human. 
This is what happens when we encounter the text. So here are some other uh, actual verses about the nearness of the hour. And this final one, uh, which says, repeats the idea of this nearness four times in a row. The hour is near to thee and nearer. It is ever nearer to thee and nearer still. So I think man should be left supreme. What, was he not a mere embryo? This is, this is quintessential Quran. This is the verse here. Aula lak faula. Tuma aula lak faula. This is the, the mood of the Quran and Muhammad's experience of things. So the eschaton is just within reach, if not happening. It raises the question amongst some uh, uh, readers and scholars, whether or not the Quran itself represents the eschaton and that what happened other after the Quran was a way of keeping this waiting alive because it comes in handy for political establishments, for example. Uh, the, the, the Abbasids and the uh, Umayyads, uh, the Buyids, the Safavids, all these political establishments depend upon the fact that the eschaton has not happened. Well, this is said very briefly and rather generally, but this is the mood and the, the basic tenor of what I wanted to communicate with you today. Finally, because we're all together here, I'd like to read to you this beautiful quotation from Hatz. The Quran continued as in Mecca and Medina to be a monumental challenge. In its form, it continued even after the ending of active revelation with Muhammad's life to be an event, an act, rather than merely a statement of facts or of norms. It was never designed to be read for information or even for inspiration, but to be recited as an act of commitment in worship nor did it become a mere sacred source of authority as the founding of Islam receded into time. It continued its active role among all who accepted Islam and took it seriously. What one did with the Quran was not to peruse it, but to worship by means of it. It's like a prayer, not to passively receive it, but in reciting it to reaffirm it for oneself. Now, this is what I wanted to share. The event of revelation was renewed every time one of the faithful in the act of worship relived the Quranic affirmations. And then finally, Hodgson says, if we think about the Quran and the Bible, the contrast is shown most keenly in comparing what happens to the soul in a reading of the Quran and in a communion with Christ. The penetrating of divine admonition on the one hand, on the other, the assumption into divine atonement. And I will stop. Thank you very much for your kind patience.